And welcome to the 20th Genomic Social Hour. Um, today we're talking about next generation sequencing in the field. I'm really excited because I've always been very intrigued but intimidated by the idea. I don't know how you feel, but when I'm in the field, I'm very used to being covered in mud. But, I, but when I do lab work, I like to be in a very controlled and sterile environment. So sequencing in the jungle is a little bit crazy for me. But real-time sequencing has obvious advantages. For example, you don't have to worry about DNA, RNA preservation as much. You get your data back right away, so you can answer your questions sooner, and that might inform your sampling strategy. And it would also definitely enhance collaboration with local researchers or make your field course more comprehensive. So today we're going to learn from four researchers who have very successful programs sequencing in the field. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody again to please turn off your camera and uh, mic during the talks. And if you have questions for the speaker, you can type in the question mark in the chat box and I'll call your name. You can unmute yourself and ask your question after the talk. So without further ado, our first speaker today is Mr. Aaron Pomerantz. Aaron is a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, and he's going to talk about his work in the Peruvian Amazon. Over to you, Aaron. Cool, thank you, Athena. And uh, yeah, I just really wanna say thanks everyone for attending and uh, especially Athena and the other um, people who have really made this, this continue. Um, it's been such a cool resource for this genomic social hour. And uh, Athena or someone else, can you just shout out really quick if it looks okay on your end? Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks very much. Um, as Athena mentioned, oops. Uh, my name is Aaron Pomerantz. Um, I am a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. And today it's uh, my privilege to share a little bit about uh, the experiences that I've had so far with uh, portable DNA sequencing in the field and uh, some interesting implications that I think that has for field biology and teaching. And I think we're gonna hear some really great talks in the next the next three presentations as well about this topic. So I figured I would just sort of jump into it and share kind of what I would consider the moment of truth, as Athena mentioned, for next generation sequencing while actually in the field. And so this is uh, what a setup of mine has looked like in the past. Here we have our portable DNA sequencer plugged into the laptop and it's generating reads to the laptop in real time, um, sequencing long amplicons. These are ribosomal uh, cluster sequences that are about 4 KB in length. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the process there, but let's dig in a little bit deeper. Um, in fact, I think I'll back up a little bit and just mention sort of you know, how, how I arrived at that point. Um, when uh, I had finished a master's degree, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do for my next step, um, but sort of serendipitously, I, I joined a colleague of mine on a trip to the Peruvian Amazon, and uh, that turned into an opportunity to work as a field biologist. And uh, so this is at, um, going into the Tamalpata Research Center. You're seeing sort of, you know, drone's eye view of the Amazon rainforest. And, you know, those of us who do this type of field work, it's just an incredible experience, right, to be able to go to these places and see with your own eyes these you know, charismatic mega and microfauna like um, these macaws and parrots that visit clay licks, um, just beautiful scenery, awesome primates. And, uh, you know, every now and then, if you're lucky, you can see something really cool and intriguing like a jaguar that's just about to, you know, cross and pop out of the river like this nice male who was crossing as we were leaving one morning out of the rainforest. Uh, so just such an incredible experience, you know, to be a field biologist and do this type of work out there. And of course, my background is in entomology, so things like the butterflies and insects really caught my eye. Um, and it was a great experience to be able to just, you know, pretend I was Darwin for a bit, you know, work on describing natural histories and writing that up as publications. Um, but, you know, you quickly realize that we just don't know a lot of what's out there. What's the actual biodiversity and what are the different organisms that make up, you know, the, the rainforest that we see, especially in the Amazon. And uh, it was during that time out there that you know, I was working with other biologists, I was working with photographers, BBC, National Geographic, people who had come out there. And you quickly learn that it's very challenging to bring all of that equipment out with you into the field. Um, but I also started to notice when I was working out there that, you know, things are just starting to become miniaturized. Um, and uh, they're becoming useful tools for biologists out there. So for example, I worked with a botanist who uh, was programming drones to fly over the canopy every single day and set coordinates. Um, so that he could, you know, use uh, high resolution images of the flowers to identify the trees, what species they were, when they were fruiting and flowering. Um, uh, mammologists who were setting out, you know, just hundreds of Bushnell camera traps everywhere to monitor everything out there in the rainforest. Um, 
I'd also come across the Foldscope, which probably many of us are familiar with at this point. Um, it was when uh, Jim Cebulski and Manu Prakash at Stanford had just released their beta version of the Foldscope that I had just started to test out. Um, and so that kind of, I think, opened my eyes to the fact that really scientific tools are getting smaller and cheaper, um, and that can have really cool implications for uh, field biology. Um, and uh, it was also at the same time, probably late 2014, early 2015, that Oxford Nanopore Technologies had just launched their sort of early access program for their Minion sequencer, which you see plugged into the laptop there. Um, and so as a field biologist, I thought this was all very cool, but I had no money, and I was not affiliated with any university at the time. Um, so I found a National Geographic grant that I had applied to at the time they had these Nat Geo weight, weight grants um, that I had applied to. And I was very happy that I received one because that really enabled me to start to test these tools um, and see if they could actually be useful out in the field. And so as far as sequencing technologies go, um, probably don't need to say to this audience that it's, you know, the sequencing technologies and the companies are really cranking out new innovations that are just producing more data, more high quality data. Um, so it's a really cool time to be involved. And it's, you know, as we know, implicating many different aspects of biology today um, to produce this type of genomic data. Um, and so here I'm just showing uh, two students that we've had in a class that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but one of them is standing next to the high seq 4000, and one of them is standing next to the, the PacBio SQL. Uh, and then here I'm holding, you know, the Oxford Nanopore Minion. So uh, this really is probably why for the next few talks you're going to hear about nanopore technology, um, just because it really is changing the dynamic of how we can think about genomic tools, whereas classically we send our samples to core facilities, um, and now you can just sort of see if you can apply it um, to, to your own places in situ in real time. And so here are a few components of the lab. This is um, a write-up and a figure that I'm trying to put together for a protocols paper. Um, and so, you know, we'll, there are several different tools and maybe some of the other speakers have used some of these in, in different ones. But I would say in a nutshell, for most of the components, you can whittle it down to a small centrifuge and a small battery pack like the RAV Power um, to run that. So this is for uh, if you want to use spin columns to isolate DNA from samples. Um, but there are other ways that you can do it maybe more cost-effectively like a Chelix resin. Um, here I'm holding the mini PCR, so that can be your portable thermocycler. Um, there are even small gel rigs that you can use to image your Amplicon with your cell phone. Um, a magnetic rack for library preparation and bead cleanups. Um, and then of course your little sequencer. So things that aren't pictured here, and sometimes I think, you know, maybe to our fault we gloss this over because we want to show sort of the bare bone elements of a lab. But there are still many things that are important to take into consideration if you try to do these experiments in the field. Uh, for example, taking into consideration cold chain, it, many of these reagents still need to be kept frozen um, in order to be efficient, like some of the enzymes. Uh, internet, or lack thereof, if you're in the field, you may need to download some of your reference databases ahead of time. Um, computational power, there are solutions for that, but that's something that's very important. Um, and also, I think as Athena touched on in the introduction, if you're doing fieldwork, there's really a trade-off with your time and the time that you're spending actually doing your, your classical field work, maybe to collect and preserve specimens, versus scalability if you do a small number of samples, um, versus cost. So these are all things that you'll have to take into consideration if you want to try and do these experiments. Uh, I'll just give a shout out too, because I've used some portable tools, but there are many others out there and many that are being developed currently. Um, I haven't used the Bento Lab, but this is sort of an all-in-one for a centrifuge, thermocycler, uh, and gel imaging station that some people have used and reported on in, in their papers recently. Uh, Mini PCR we mentioned, but there's another company called Mini One, and they also have uh, comparable systems for thermocyclers and uh, imaging gels and things like that. Um, and then, of course, Luxor Nanopore Technologies is constantly, uh, you know, putting out new iterations of their of their platforms. Um, for a computational processor, they had this Minute device, which is being phased out. Um, and more recently, they've introduced what they call their MK1C, which would be their all-in-one package that would hold the flow cell and be able to do the computational processing as well. So everything's changing very constantly. Um, but maybe it's worth just touching on, since you know I'm going first, we're going to hear a lot of uh, the compelling research that other researchers have been doing on this call. Um, but you know, maybe we can just take a moment to consider what is the actual value or purpose of trying to go portable with your DNA sequencing? You know, why not just do the classical route of collecting samples and, you know, shipping them abroad, typically, to, um, uh, to core sequence, sequencing facilities. And I think a few compelling reasons, this is by no means a comprehensive list, but um, some of the early versions of when people took these out to the fields were for rapid pathogen surveillance and diagnostics. 
Uh, so for example, the 2014, 2015 Ebola outbreak, there was real-time viral sequencing uh, to see how it was evolving and changing and mapping it to the, you know, the point of origin for different strains. Uh, there have been recent efforts for Zika surveillance, um, lots going on, for example, with cassava viruses and trying to give uh, farmers better access to assessing which strains there are or if they're infected. Um, and of course, most recently, COVID-19 testing, um, which we can all imagine why that's, that's important to try and get that data faster and in real time. Um, I think there are also really good reasons for um, food security, biomonitoring efforts, uh, rapid detection of invasive species, um, and then elements that we'll also hear about in the talk later today for conservation genomics and wildlife trafficking. So I think, um, again, there's a no means, by no means a comprehensive list, we'll also hear about chytrid fungus and many other reasons that I think are important that we might want to do more rapid and on-site DNA sequencing. So for myself, you know, I, I thought it would be interesting to try and combine these tools and test them out in the field. Um, I spent a little bit of time also designing and making my own 3D printed centrifuge inspired by some of the work out of uh, Manu Prakash's lab for some uh, low cost DIY equipment. And uh, I'll just briefly touch on, you know, one of the first studies where we went out to the field and I collaborated with a cohort of herpetologists. Um, and this was in Ecuador. We went to uh, the Choco region of Ecuador, um, which uh, as David could probably touch on is a, is a very important region for biodiversity. Um, but it's also being deforested very rapidly. And th these are palm oil plantations that we're driving by on our way into the rainforest. And uh, so I, fe I felt that this was a good opportunity in place to work with field biologists who were going to go out and do this biodiversity survey anyway um, to collect some samples and then just see if we could um, help to process that in a faster amount of time. Uh, so I let the professional herpetologists do the wrangling, especially for uh, venomous snakes where they're you know, gently handling them and taking small blood samples. Um, so then they passed it along to me and with the equipment that I've shown previously, just handled some of the downstream processing for the molecular steps. Um, so basically once they handed me the sample, um, within the span of a few hours from DNA isolation to PCR, um, to preparing the library and then loading it on the flow cell, takes under 24 hours. Um, and again, this might play into the amount of samples that you're trying to process and in this case, it was a fairly small number of samples, about a dozen, um, using the DNA barcoding kit that Nanopore provides. Um, but in any case, you know, when we compared those reference sequences that we generated for these short amplicons um, that they had a reference database for previously, um, we could at least see that the accuracy was quite high in most cases, you know, compared to a reference like a Sanger sequence. Um, and in some cases, you still have some errors in homopolymer regions, which is, which is a common um, issue to have in Nanopore uh, data. And then uh, more recently, one, one uh, technique that I thought was really clever, this was designed by uh, Heinrich Rehenwinkel, who I think has maybe given a talk at this presentation before. Um, but while he was in Rosemary Gillespie's lab, I worked with him um, and we came up with a protocol for um, basically using, taking advantage of the fact that nanopore can generate very long reads um, to sequence the entire ribosomal complex from eukaryotes. So, you know, typically maybe people will use short amplicons for maybe fungal samples or plants where they'll have multiple primers that amplify specific regions of this ribosomal complex, like just ITS1 or maybe ATNS. Um, but what Heinrich did, which I thought was really clever, was look for very highly conserved regions on ATNS and 28S. And so this can amplify across the entire region, um, which is generally around 4,000 base pairs, depends a little bit on the taxa, um, because the ITS regions can be a bit more variable in their length. Um, but what we also did is we added these um, unique indexes to the primers themselves. So it's just a one-step PCR, and then you can just mix and match your different combinations of indexes. In this case, there are about 24 base pairs um, in length so that they can be demultiplexed into different, um, the different taxa. So again, this is taking each individual sample and doing a PCR in each one. So probably not as high throughput as something like metabarcoding or metagenomics that we may hear a bit more about. Um, but I think it's a really nice and useful way of um, being able to multiplex a very high number of taxa. And uh, again, we, we also um, worked with some folks at the Cal Academy actually to design some of the software um, to more effectively uh, demultiplex these reads um, into their folders. And uh, if you'd like, you can read a little bit more about that that's published on Giga Science now um, by showing that you know, these long ribosomal markers, um, they're very simple to use and you only need one primer set to amplify different taxa from plants to fungi to insects. Um, so I think it's a really nice conserved primer set um, and that's easy to use with this uh, dual indexing approach. 
And then I'll just briefly mention, um, as we segue a little bit more into the educational component, you know, I thought it'd be, it's, it's one thing to maybe have these simple protocols, but can, can we make them simple enough to teach them to anybody in a short amount of time? And so I worked with um, some folks in, back in Peru who were working with a lodge. This is the Inca Terra Lodge near, uh, in Tambopata as well. Um, and we opened up what we called a Genomics in the Jungle course. So this was a cohort that was open to anybody. Um, you know, we had high school students, college students, um, some postdocs, and some people who joined the class who were, you know, not scientists at all. They were just interested in learning some molecular biology while being out in the Amazon rainforest. And so we set out what we called the Green Lab. This was uh, basically an empty space that the ecotourism company gave us um, to set up and put in some, some of the funding to set up some laboratory equipment. And uh, it, was, it was a really great experience and a learning experience. We tried to combine what we learned and uh, we wrote this up as a community page in Plus Biology. Um, so please check it out if you'd like to learn more or get in touch with me. Um, and uh, what we also have in there is a list of, you know, the equipment that we thought was helpful. And again, we can talk a little bit more maybe at the end about some of the challenges like with power or internet access. Um, but overall, that was a really great learning experience when, you know, we just sort of went out to the jungle and set up this lab to do uh, real time sequencing. And these are some of the taxa that we sequence while out in the field with students. And we're come, I'm coming up a little bit on the 15 minutes. And so I want to make sure I'm good on time. But in the very last minute or two, I just want to give a shout out to um, our efforts to develop this as a short format course, or maybe a program we would call it, where it's a two week intensive course. Um, and we designed this with Berkeley freshman undergraduates. Um, and so what we did is we basically tried to design it where the first part of the class would be sort of teaching them classic field biology. We didn't try and take students abroad to Peru. We decided, uh, you know, we've got the UC Berkeley Botanical Garden up here, which is an amazing resource in and of itself. So we just, you know, took a short bus ride up the hill. and. Uh, so here's just some clips of, uh, there's Ben Corinne, who I think is on the call, and several other graduate students who are involved um, with uh, helping to design this class. And so we had several projects. I don't have time to talk about all the projects that we did with students, um, but I'll at least just give a, a quick uh, results of the plant project. And so uh, uh, Vanessa Hanley, um, basically in, in the field, um, like Colombia and Mexico, she had collected plant samples that they then bring back to the botanical gardens. But in many cases, uh, she didn't have a great identification for several of these plants. They were probably young, they weren't fruiting or flowering. So we thought that would be a fun uh, experiment for the students to take on, sort of like solving a mystery by sequencing barcodes from the plants and seeing it how well those would sync up with Vanessa's sort of at the family level guess of what the taxonomic ID was. And so we then took the students and you know, taught them the downstream molecular biology steps, DNA isolation, PCR, gel electrophoresis. Um, they then loaded their own flow cell, which was a lot of fun. And again, this, this went from on Monday collecting the samples to Thursday sequencing it right here. So it's a very short turnaround time for them to be able to touch every aspect of the experiment from collecting their plant sample all the way to generating that data and processing it. Um, I'll give a, a quick slide if you'd like to test these out. We could probably have a much longer conversation about some of the bioinformatic tools to take your raw reads and then process them in such a way that you get a nice, highly accurate consensus sequence. Um, there's different aspects and ways you can go about it, probably for metabarcoding and things like that, um, or genomic processing. Um, but at least with Amplicons, um, uh, Stefan Prost and others are trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, they recently put out um, what's called NG Species ID, which um, is very easy to use and download. But I'd be very interested if some of you are, were interested to test this out. Um, basically, a program uh, where it will combine several software like um, clustering, um, polishing, um, and you can integrate like Madaka and Raccoon. And overall, this seems to do a, a very nice job of producing a high quality consensus sequence. But there are several other strategies that exist, and we could talk about those. But in any case, I'll just briefly mention that the students did a great job. Um, I was a little bit surprised that freshman undergraduates did such a great job of taking 12 samples and successfully doing PCR and sequencing all 12 samples. They had all positive results on the first go. Um, and you know, based on the morphology, the best guess of, at the family level for several of these plants from Vanessa, um, they did, a, I think, a pretty nice job of having, uh, at least to the family level, matches in all cases for their top blast hits. So I'm sure in many of these cases, there wasn't a reference database match. That's probably one of the biggest problems, I think, still with biodiversity research and, and um, doing these amplicon sequences. 
um, is that there's a lot of times not a great reference database, but in any case, they matched up most of the time. In some cases, there was a discrepancy. And, and so maybe the students actually did a better job in some cases of using the blast hit um, versus the morphology guessed. Um, we also uh, did lots of demos and tours and tried to make it a really um, comprehensive short form uh, class where the students then put together their presentations. Um, so just since I'm running out of time, I just really quickly want to acknowledge all the folks who made this possible for um, these courses at Berkeley. We, of course, weren't able to do this again this past summer, um, but we hope to do this again. And we have seed funding from Berkeley to run more of these programs. Um, and so we would love to hear from you if you have any comments or suggestions on how we can improve it. Um, thanks to a lot of folks um, at Berkeley and some of the companies that helped donate some of the reagents for these educational programs. And I will go ahead and stop there. Thanks. Can you see it all right, Adhana? Yes. OK, wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you, Cal Academy, for the opportunity to talk. So today I'm going to talk to you about genomic tracking of the illegal wildlife trade. Uh, I want to start with a slightly lighter note and suggest that sharks can be gentle to be around. So. Here is a little video of a, of a whale shark that we took while snorkeling with it in Ningaloo. And the reason I do this is because most people have a, have a not so great perception of sharks thanks to movies like Jaws. So here we were swimming it with it, keeping the safe recommended distance. And you can see the human in the back, and that gives you some perspective about the size of this shark. And everything was going fine until the shark decides to turn around and come towards us. And uh, of course, it is swimming much faster than we can. So everybody's trying, scrambling, trying to figure out where to go. And then, of course, it finds its way and everything is all good. So yeah, so sharks are not only gentle and can be fun and charismatic to be around, but they're also really crucial to marine ecosystems and food security. Uh, previous studies have shown that where sharks have been taken out in an ecosystem that has caused damage to reef systems, as well as um, affected um, commercial fisheries. So that tells us they're also really important to our economy. Sharks are also evolutionary giants. Um, they've been around for about 450 million years. So that, that just tells us that they are just extremely resilient in terms of evolutionary time. And the reason that is that is that they have extremely high genome stability and some amazing immunological functions. They're also one of the most diverse species group with about 1,200 known species till date. So all of this just makes them a really interesting evolutionary system to study. In spite of this, we have, we have failed to save our planet's biodiversity, including shark biodiversity. So the United Nations Global Biodiversity Outlook suggested that we are failing to protect all uh, biodiversity, including marine biodiversity. And this is reflected in upwards of 30% of shark species being threatened worldwide, as shown in this graph here. So all of the regions that are highlighted in red and yellow are, have, have species that are, have a high percentage of threatened species with respect to sharks. You can see here that with those little arrows uh, in black, that the areas that are data deficient, uh, that, that have a high, number of threatened species are also have a very high um, shark landing ratio, which means that they have a very significant contribution to um, shark fishing and exports. So overexploitation of sharks has and rays has occurred because of the fin trade. 
on an average every year, about 300 million sharks are taken out, primarily to support the fin trade. But then there are also secondary trades that are supported by this, including um, demand for the gills, oil, cartilage, and also meat. So why is this happening? Why are we unable to protect shark biodiversity? And the reason is that while our the ratio of marine protected areas has gone up by about fourfold in the last in the last decade species are not represented well in this protection or protection uh, conservation measures that that we are taking so you can see here in this in this purple dotted line that the protection of sharks has actually or conservation of sharks has actually just kind of stayed almost the same over the last decade. And the reason we are failing to protect the right areas and we are failing to protect sharks is that we don't understand enough in terms of their conservation status to be able to protect them. So about 46% of shark and ray species are data deficient. And the areas that are the most data deficient are again highlighted in, in in red and yellow, with red being the highest data deficiency areas. So when we don't understand enough about their populations or distribution, it, it's kind of hard to protect a given species or a group of species. And this is reflected in illegal fishing incidents that are occurring in many of our MPAs. So some of the largest marine protected areas in the world today also have illegal fishing, and this has decimated some of their shark populations by about 85%. And this is not only detrimental to shark biodiversity, but it is extremely detrimental to the, to the marine ecosystems in these areas, because sharks are apex predators, and loss of sharks leads to trophic, trophic effects and downgrading of the downstream marine ecosystems. So when we think about stopping illegal fishing, we need to know where is illegal fishing happening and which countries are accountable or who is really accountable for this. Well, this question becomes really complicated to answer because illegal fishing today is uh, responsible, it is, is kind of a transnational organized crime. So there are various issues starting from invisibility of vessels, meaning that uh, so ships are required to have this vessel monitoring system. But a lot of uh, fishing vessels will just turn off these monitoring systems. So there is no communication with the satellite monitoring systems. So they're invisible. There's trans shipping and flag hopping. So there is a, a a ship can take a flag of convenience depending on where they want to fish and then sell the sell the fish. And then there's also trans shipping, so transfer of contents from a given fishing vessel at sea to these uh, vessels that we call reefers. And then these reefers can then go and sell the, the caught fish in an area where the original fishing vessel, vessel may not have had license or rights. To, to fish in the first place. And then lastly, there is seafood fraud. So oftentimes we are sold seafood that is called something, but it's actually something else. For example, a 2019 report in the UK suggested that about 70% of the fish and chips shops that, are, that were evaluated were actually selling shark and chips. So, this tells us that we need a method that is tamper-proof and incorruptible in order to determine where illegal fishing is happening, which populations are the most targeted, and which areas and populations should be urgently protected. So I envision that genomic surveillance of oceans is really key to, to this question. And genomic surveillance helps us answer two questions or two questions that are then critical to us deciding which areas and populations to protect. First is to determine species ecology, including, um, including species distribution, population health, 
with respect to population size and genetic diversity, determining population structure so that we can figure out which populations are isolated, whereas which are connected, and what is their potential to replenish each other or depleted populations. The last is we also need to know what which populations have evolutionary potential. And, and if a given population is has has is significantly distinct from the rest of the species' populations, then it, it becomes a separate ecological unit and uh, requires urgent protection. So that is one aspect. So to determine species ecology using genomics. And the other aspect is to figure out using genomics and monitoring of fisheries what species and populations are being fished and who is fishing these. Now, some of this work has been done using other um, next generation sequencing methods. For example, uh, Pasmino et al. Did, did, did studies in the Galapagos sharks where they figured out transoceanic uh, species population structure as well as uh, population structure within the Galapagos archipelago. And then with regards to monitoring of illegal wildlife trade, Wasser et al. have, have shown using microsatellite studies where they, where they made these maps of where the most elephants were being poached across Africa. And then law enforcement was was focused on areas that were identified as hotspots for poaching. So the, 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 the revolution, the current revolution in, next, in, in sequencing technologies has given us a once in a lifetime opportunity to look at sharks uh, in, the open, in the open ocean, the same way we've been looking at humans and, and coming up with personalized medicine. So when, when I talk about genomic surveillance of our oceans for determining species ecology, for studying species ecology and the illegal fishing uh, and wildlife trade, we need to build capacity for genomic surveillance in areas with the highest need, such as in India, where, where I come from. So one of my previous projects was in India, and this work was supported by the Society for Conservation Biology. India is the second largest shark fishing nation in the world, and it is also one of the most data deficient places with respect to sharks, meaning we don't understand enough about sharks in this area to be able to protect them. So we were surveying the western part of Gujarat, which uh, western part of India in the state of Gujarat, which is the largest contributor of shark fisheries within India. And we were sampling four different ports in Gujarat. Which, were, which are known to be heavily involved in shark and ray fishing. So in our biodiversity surveys of the fisheries in Gujarat, we identified about 30 species that were being landed. Uh, many of them were threatened um, and uh, critically endangered or vulnerable species. There was a high percentage of uh, females and juveniles in these landings, which was very concerning because we were depleting these populations really quickly by actually targeting females and juveniles. We also identified range extensions for about three, for, for three different species, meaning these species were reported for the first time in Gujarat. However, 33% of our samples couldn't be, uh, couldn't be identified. And that's, that's one third of our samples, which is, which is big. And the reason we couldn't identify them was that they were dismembered. Like this particular fin here, we had no idea where it came from. However, this fin was slated for the international fin trade. So it was slated for export in this particular location. This particular location where we were uh, doing these studies was also about seven hours away from the close, was about seven hours away from a sequencing facility. And even if we could get the sample there in time, we didn't know if they would be able to do the PCRs and the assays that we needed to do to get to the, the barcode that would allow us to identify the species. And 
all in all, if even if all of this worked, it would be about 48 hours, by which time we wouldn't know where the spin went or what was happening to it and who was, who was responsible for doing this. So um, we, we realized the need for a method that reduced the burden of sample preparation and could allow us to get to the result of species identification very quickly. And until, until, until this point, most of the methods that were used for species identification relied on amplicon sequencing of either the cytochrome oxidase 1 region or the NADH2 region of the mitochondrial genome. However, we, didn't, we hadn't had much success in amplifying this particular region for all of our specimens because, yeah, we just, uh, we weren't sure if there was good primer binding. And the other reason was that even if we had amplified this for everybody, we couldn't be 100% sure that our species identification was correct because many of the shark species, they have identical uh, barcodes in these two regions. So that's why we, we felt the need for a method that would allow us to cover a larger area of the genome, either the mitochondrial or the nuclear, but preferably mitochondrial because we knew there's greater amounts of mitochondrial DNA in any given sample. And if we could get multiple regions of the mitochondria, we could uh, reliably determine species ID. And the other advantage of having larger chunks of the mitochondrial and the nuclear genome was also to then get to species ecology studies, including uh, looking at population structure, population size, and species biology in general. So given these needs in mind, we developed this method called genome skimming, which essentially relied on us feeding genomic DNA uh, to the MENA and sequencer. And we got a whole bunch of reads from it. And the high copy numbers of high copy number regions of the genome had higher coverage. And this include mitochondrial uh, genome sequences as, as well as nuclear sequences. Using this method, we were able to get about uh, I think it was 74,000 sequences for this particular sample. And out of these 47 reads uh, were uh, mapped to the mitochondrial genome. We did this uh, using the Genius software. And we did the sequencing for about 36 hours, but within the first two minutes, we were already getting some mitochondrial sequences. And within, within three hours, for sure, we could tell that this, where this particular mitochondrial sequence or which species this particular mitochondrial sequence belongs to. So using these sequence reads, we were able to get the complete mitochondrial genome of, of the sample. And we went within three to six hours from an unknown species all the way to an accurate mitochondrial genome and the species was identified as a silky shark in this case. So this not only helped us know, helped us to know that the species was found in Gujarat in this particular area, but we were also able to uncover illegal fishing of this uh, and trade of the species, uh, which is a CITES listed species. So international trade um, of this particular org organism is, is banned. And as I mentioned before, this, this fin was actually slated for export in the fin trade. We've also used this method to enable species distribution studies in the Chagos archipelago or in the British Indian Ocean territory. And there we need to uh, figure out what are the strongholds for two reef shark species gray reef sharks and silver tip reef sharks specifically within this particular archipelago. And the reason for that is that even though this is a marine protected area, there is illegal fishing and we need to, we need to identify which areas we should be protecting the most. And, and so that's why we needed mitochondrial genomes of these two, these two species 
two uh, design primers for environmental DNA analysis, which would then allow us to determine where species populations are located using a species specific assay for environmental DNA sequencing. Um, and we also were able to get mitochondrial genomes for the, sil for the silky shark and the white tip reef shark in this particular location. So the genome skimming method on the Minayan is, is quite versatile because it allows sequencing of DNA with uh, varying GC contents. For example, it can enable sequencing of uh, some of the most highly traded wildlife species such as pangolins, elephants, and rhinos. And of course, a whole bunch of sharks and rays. By now, we have sequenced about seven to uh, seven or eight different species of sharks and rays, including manta rays, guitar fishes, which are, uh, which are critically endangered today. And of course, a lot of different um, shark species, as I just mentioned. So, you know, with, with all of the illegal wildlife trade or illegal fisheries, we can, we can monitor the oceans as much as we want and we can, we can create laws and enforcement as much as we want. But it is really important for us to build community partnerships and engage in a dialogue with the communities, with the fishing communities that are responsible for um, engaging in this trade because for many of these communities, it is a source of livelihood. So we can tell them, yeah, don't fish sharks, but they, they are going to come up with another way to do it in spite of the laws because they need that to feed their families. So we need to engage in a dialogue where we explain to them that sharks are very eco ecologically very important. So even though they may not be a big part of their, of their catch, even catching a few sharks is detrimental to commercial fisheries, which, may, which they may really depend on. So when we did this work in Gujarat, we took our results back to the communities and three students, um, including Anjani, Anisa, and Isabella, Helped me, helped, he, helped me in this project. So here you can see Anjani explaining her findings to um, this fisherwoman here and explaining, and in this poster here, we're explaining that how teleos and in, can reproduce really quickly and have, a high, have high fecundity, but sharks take a really long time to, to mature and then produce very few young. And then in this case, I'm talking to students um, from in the zoology department who are very interested in fisheries and how they can influence fisheries policies in the future. And then in the left uh, bottom corner, we are talking to the fishing communities and discussing what could be pathways to sustainable fisheries in the future. So in summary, we need to build capacity for genomic surveillance of our oceans and um, engage in species ecology studies, but as well as fisheries monitoring and in community dialogues and outreach and education. And all of this together will lead to efficient conservation. With that, I would like to thank uh, the Block Lab at Stanford University and our collaborators and funders. And thank you all for listening. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions.